Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The High Flyers is a novel written by Clarence Budington Kelland, an American author who is well known for his novels, short stories, and film scripts. Kelland authored more than 60 novels, some of which were turned into movies. He was also a journalist and editor in his early career. In the book, the protagonist, John Harlow, is not only an aspiring entrepreneur but also an aviation enthusiast. His passion for flying and his determination to succeed in the aviation industry is a central aspect of the story. He faces numerous challenges in both his personal and professional life as he pursues his dream of becoming a prominent figure in the burgeoning world of aviation. The title of the High Flyers is a metaphor that refers to both the literal act of flying in airplanes and the figurative concept of achieving great success or flying high in life. The novel highlights the excitement risks, and rewards associated with the early days of aviation, capturing the spirit of adventure and innovation that characterized this period in history. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 1 Fred Longloth was speaking. After a certain number of beverages composed of scotch whiskey, imported soda, and a cube of ice, It was a matter of comparative ease for him to exhibit a notable fluency. After two o'clock in the afternoon, Fred was generally fluent. Taint safe, I says to him. And the wind was blowing enough to lift the hair out of your head. I wouldn't go up in the thing for the price of it, I says, and besides, you're seeing two of it. Bad enough driving a car when you're lit up, I says, but what these flying machines want is a still day and a man that's cold sober. You just let it rest on its little perch in the bird cage. Fred refreshed his parched throat while his four companions waited for the conclusion of the tale. You'll bust your neck, I told him. Ten to one, says he. I round windmill point light and come back without bustin' my neck. Even money I make it without bustin' anything, says he. Dinner for four at the teller tonight that the least you bust is a leg, I says, and the wind whipped the hat off my head and whirled it into a tree. Fred stopped, evidently mourning the loss of his hat. Well, said Will Kramer, impatiently, what happened? Did he go up? Him? I paid for that dinner, but believe me, there were times when I thought I'd have to collect from his estate. Ever see a leaf blowing around in a gale? Well, that's how he looked out over the lake. Just bounding and twirling and twisting, but he went the distance and came back and landed safe. Got out of the dingus just like he was getting off a pullman. Patted the thing on the wing like it was a pet chicken. Let's drive down to the poncher train, he says. Likely the crowd's there. Not another darn word. Just that. Trouble with Potter Waite, said Tom Watts, is that he just naturally don't give a damn. If he's going to pull something, he'd as leaf pull it in the middle of Woodward Avenue at noon by the village clock as to pull it on the six-mile road at midnight. 
No pussy footin' for him, said Jack Eldridge. My old man was talking about him the other night. Day after he cleaned up those two taxi drivers out here in front. Don't let me hear of you running around with that young weight, he says. He's a bad actor. You keep off him. He's a lifesaver, Fred Longmuth joined in. When dad lights into me, I just mention Potter and dad forgets me entirely. You ought to hear dad when he really gets to going on Potter. I'm no Sunday school boy, Dash, said Brick O'Mara. Do tell, jibed Eldridge. But I'll say Potter is crowed in the mourners. I wouldn't follow his trail a week steady. The others waggled their heads acquiescently. Even to their minds, Potter Waite traveled at too high speed and with too little thought of public opinion. About that table sat five young men who were as much a result of a condition as outlying subdivisions are the result of a local boom. Of them all, Longmuth came from a family which had known moderate wealth for generations, but it had grown swiftly, unbelievably, during the past few wonderful years to a great fortune. Of the rest, Kramer and O'Mara were the sons of machinists who, a dozen years before, would have considered carefully before giving their sons 15 cents to sit in the gallery at the old Whitney Opera House to see Sawmill and Pile Driver and Fire Engine drama. The automobile had caught them up and poured millions into their laps. Eldridge was the son of a bookkeeper who, 15 years ago, had drawn $50 at the end of each month for his services. For every dollar of that monthly salary, he could now show a million. Watts was the son of a lawyer whom sheer good luck had lifted from a practice consisting of the collection of small debts and made a stockholder in an advisor to a gigantic automobile concern. And these boys were the sons of those swiftly gotten millions. They had forgotten the old days, just as Detroit, their home city, had forgotten its old drowsiness, its Midwestern quietness and conservatism. One might compare Detroit to a demure village girl, pleasing, beautiful, growing up with no other thought than to become a wife and mother when, by chance, some great impresario hears her singing about her work and it is discovered that she has one of the world's rarest voices. From her the old things and the old thoughts and the old habits of life are gone forever. The world pours wealth and admiration at her feet and her name rings from continent to continent. So with the lovely old city struggling along the shores of that inland strait, she has become a prima donna among cities. The old identity is gone, replaced by something else less homely, but mightier, grander. Her population, which, within the memory of boys not out of high school, numbered less than 300,000 souls, was now reported to be thrice that, and, by the optimistic, even more. Her wealth has not doubled or trebled, but multiplied by an unbelievable figure, and she has spent it with unbelievable lavishness. Where once were cobblestone pavements and horse cars are countless swarms of automobiles, where once were meadows, pastures, woodlots, are tremendous plants employing armies of men, covering scores of acres, turning out annual products which bring to the city hundreds of millions of dollars. In the history of the world, no city has come into such a fortune as Detroit, nor has there been such universal prosperity not to employ her alone, but to employees and to the least of employees. It seemed as if the day had arrived when one asked, not where he should get money, but what he should do with his money. So Detroit spent. It built magnificent hotels, it created palaces for its millionaires, and miles upon miles of homes luxurious, costly homes for those whose handsome salaries passed the dreams of their youth or whose fortunes, 
built up by contact with the trade of purveying automobiles to an eager world had not even been hoped for ten years before. Even the laborer had his home. Why not, when one manufacturer paid to the man who swept his floors the minimum wage of five dollars a day? That was before the war, before a solemn covenant became a scrap of paper and the world fell sick of its most horrible disease. Then Detroit was rich, was spending lavishly but not insanely. With the coming of war there was a halt, a fright, a retrenchment, a hesitation, for no man knew what the next day might bring. But as the next day brought no disaster, as it became apparent that the coming days were to bring something quite different from disaster, Detroit went ahead gaily. Then came strangers from abroad, speaking other languages than ours, and then began to whisper that this plant had a $10 million contract from Russia for shrapnel fuses, this other plant a $20 million contract for trucks, this other a fabulous arrangement for manufacturing this or that bit of the devil's prescription for slaughtering men and the whispers proved true. The automobile brought amazingly sudden wealth, munition manufacture added to it with a blinding flash in Detroit came to know what spending was. These five young men, sitting in mid-afternoon in the Hotel Poncho train bar, were a part of all this, their life was the result of it, the thoughts, or lack of thoughts, in their minds, derived from it inevitably, remorselessly. They were castaways thrown up in a bar room by a golden flood. To four of them a nickel for candy had been an event, now, without mental anguish, each of them could sign a dinner check which stretched to three figures, or buy a runabout or a yacht, or afford the luxury of acquaintance with the young woman who stood forth from the end in the front row. Let them not be chided too harshly. The fault was not theirs wholly, but was the inevitable result of their environment. They played at work, drew salaries but could spend their afternoons in the poncho train, in the teller, on the links or at the dancent. They knew no responsibility to man, felt but a hazy responsibility to God, and as for their country, they had never thought about its existence. They talked of the war, were pro-ally with the exception of Kramer, whom they baited when the fit was on them. Kramer had been born on Brady Street. His grandfather was a 48er. It was natural that he should see Aitoi with the land from which he derived his blood. Of them all, he alone took the war with seriousness, so they baited him at times, and he raged for their amusement. They began the sport now. If the Kaiser only had the Grand Duke, said La Muth, he might stand some show. Look what he's done and what he had to do it with. I don't figure it'll last much longer. Everybody's licking Germany. Kramer banged the table. You'll see, he said, passionately. The war would be over now if it wasn't for the neutrality of the United States. This country is just prolonging the agony. If it wasn't for the munitions the Allies get from here, we'd be in Paris and London and St. Petersburg. Devil of a neutrality, ain't it? Look here. Rats, said O'Mara. Where's Potter, anyhow? Haven't seen him today. Ought to be drifting in. He's over at police headquarters, said a new voice, and Tom Randall beckoned a waiter and sat down at the table. Pinched again, came in chorus. No, but he'll probably get himself pinched before he's through with it. Know the Von Essen girl? Hildegard, you mean? Sassy one? Swiftest flapper that ever flapped. That's the darling. Well, she drives that runabout of hers down Jefferson again, 
doing nothing less than 45 and making real time in spots. Seems she's been fined pretty average regular. Well, traffic cop gets her and makes her haul up to the curb and crawls right in beside her. Aha. Uh-huh. And off they go to the station, her looking like she could bite off the steering wheel. Well, Potter and I are coming along in his car and we see the excitement and tag after. You know Potter? We do. It's that Von Essen kid, isn't it? He says to me, and I agree with him. She's been caught too regular, he says. They'll be nasty. Better trail along and see if we can help out. So we did. Got to the station simultaneous and adjacent to them and out jumps Potter. Afternoon, Miss Von Essen, says he. Mr. Wait, she says, cool as a bisque tortoni. Pinched, says he. Ask him, she says, and jerks her head toward the cop, who is clambering down. She is, says the cop, and this time she gets what's coming to her. She been a damn nuisance, he says, and this here time I'm going to put her over the jumps. Get out and get inside, he says to her. Well, Potter sort of edged up to the cop and looks him over and says, I don't really see why this young lady has to go inside. You can make your complaint and that about ends your usefulness. She stays, says the cop, and if I got anything to say about it, she sleeps on a plank. You wouldn't care to do that, would you, Miss Von Essen, says Potter with that grin of his and I made ready to duck because when he grins that way dash. We know said the boys. Now you listen to reason, says Potter. A police station is no place for a young lady. It doesn't smell pleasantly. So she doesn't go in. If bail's necessary or if anything's necessary, I'm here for that. But omit the stern policeman part of it. Get out and come in, says the cop to the girl. You and I are going in, friend, says Potter, and he took hold of the policeman's arm. We'll fix this up, not the young lady. Come on, says Potter, with his left fist all doubled up and ready. The cop knew Potter, so they parleyed, and then they walked under the porch you know the entrance to the station and in a couple of minutes out comes Potter looking sort of sneering and shoving a roll of bills into his pocket. Seems there was some mistake, he says to Miss Von Essen. It wasn't you who broke the speed ordinance, it was I. I've arranged the mistake with the officer. Now, for Cat's sake, cut it out. You'll be breaking into print good one of these days and there'll be the devil to pay or breaking your neck. You'll get yourself talked about if you don't ease off some. And, said Randall, he hardly knows the girl. Some line of talk for Potter to ladle out. What did she say? Her eyes just glittered at him. She's a handsome little cat, but I'll bet she can scratch. Coming from you, she says, that advice is thrilling. Her engine was still running. She slammed into gear, stepped on the gas, and shot over to Randolph Street. Potter looked after her and chuckled. Promising kid, he said. You chase along, Tom. They want me inside. So here I am. Guess he can take care of himself. Here he comes, said Longmoth. Didn't get locked up, anyhow. 
A tall young man who did not need padding in the shoulders of his coat was making his way between the tables. He wore a plaid cap jauntily on his yellow hair. He was not handsome, but at first glance one was apt to call him handsome if you were in good humor. You liked his face, except at times when he was alone or thoughtful. Then it distressed you, for you could not make out the meaning of its expression. Then his blue eyes, which were twinkling now, looked dark and brooding. He had a way of looking dissatisfied in something worse, more disquieting something not to be defined. Ordinarily his face was such as to draw men to him, even older men who quite disliked him and used his mode of life as a text for dissertations on what the young man of today was coming to. One thing might be said with safety he possessed personality. When he was one of a group he dominated it. He was not a boy to leave out of the reckoning. When one of his fits, as his friends called them, was dark upon him, even those who knew him best and regarded themselves as closest to him were a bit uneasy in his company. The most hearty and reckless of them was moved at such times to go away from there, for Potterweight usually set out on some mad enterprise when that mood was on him. He would set a pace few cared to follow. You never know what he's thinking about, Kramer said frequently. It was true. But you did not know that he was thinking and that he could think. Also he never followed, he led. For him consequences did not exist. If he set out to do a thing, he did it and let consequences take care of themselves. And as the boys complained, He went his reprehensible way with a brass band. The idea of concealing his escapades seemed not to occur to him. What do you have? called Randall, whose waiter had come to him. A stein, a quart of scotch, and a bottle of soda, said Potter. What's that, sir? said the waiter. Deliver it as ordered, said Potter with a boyish smile that got him quicker and better service than other men's tips. The waiter obeyed and the boys watched with interest. Potter poured a generous half pint into the stein upon the ice and filled the stone mug with soda. I'm going to get, said Jack Eldridge. Something's going to bust loose around here. Potter sat back comfortably and sipped from his stein. He appeared unconscious that, from other tables, glances were directed toward him and that men standing at the bar mentioned his name and pointed him out to companions. He began chatting pleasantly. Not pinched, I asked Randall. Suppose I'll get mine in the morning, Potter said, without interest. I'd have let her take her medicine, Randall said. It wasn't any of your funeral. Didn't even say thank you. Potter looked at him musingly. That was the best part of it, he said, presently. Sort of proves she's being natural, not for flushing like some of these girls. They'd have burbled and kissed my hand stepped out of character, you know. She didn't. A boy came into the room with an armful of papers. What he called could not be heard distinctly above the din of the place. Potter raised his hand and the boy threw a paper before him. The young man glanced at it, seemed to stiffen. He sat back in his chair while the others watched him, arrested by something in his manner, something portentous. He stood up and looked from one to the other of them. Then he laid down the paper slowly. The Lusitania has been torpedoed, he said, in a quiet voice, without warning. Hundreds of Americans are lost women and children. 
He stopped and repeated the last words. Women and children. For a moment he stood motionless. It means war, he said. Every eye was on him. He held them. He stopped them as if they had been so many clocks with their hands pointing to this fateful hour. He made them feel the event. Nobody spoke. Potter turned very slowly and surveyed the room, then, still very slowly, he walked out of the room without a word or a nod. His stein was left, scarcely touched, before his chair. Chapter 2 Potter Waits stood a moment at the curb beside his car, looking at the heart of this great new city. At his right, Cadillac Square stretched broadly away to the county building's square tower. Within his memory, this handsome space had been a public market, unsightly, evil of odor, reeking with decaying vegetables and the refuse of the meat stalls. Today it was overcrowded with parked automobiles. At his left opened the campus marshes, bisected by the magnificent width of Woodward Avenue. There, on its little irregular plot, squatted the city hall, shabby, slatternly, forbidding. It seemed, against the background, the palisade of upreaching skyscrapers of terracotta and brick to typify that thing we tolerate as municipal government. As was the shabby building to its clean, its magnificent neighbors, so was the thing it contained the government of a great city to the governments of private enterprises which had made that city a place to excite the envious admiration of her sister municipalities. Potter frowned at the thought. The huge machine of government was made up of such parts of common councils, of mayors, of state legislatures, of national legislatures, differing only in degree, but wrought of kindred materials. It was this machine with which the country would make war. It won't work, Potter said to himself. It hasn't the stroke or the bore. He stood still looking at the teeming campus following its currents and cross-currents and eddies with eyes darkened by thought. It was a current worthy to pass between magnificent banks. The sidewalks eddied with never motionless men and women with human beings whose errands hurried them on. Potter studied them with interest. Their faces were mobile, alert, intelligent, forceful. There was a capability about each individual, there was something distinct about each atom in the crowd. Here, after all, was the great machine of government. Here was that from which government derived, here was that which would make war, which would fight the war. Walking down that street was a potential army, and the mothers of a potential army. It was these who had made possible who had created the terracotta skyscrapers, it was these who had made possible that marvelous procession of automobiles which taxed the width of Woodward Avenue, it was these who had made possible the building up of that miracle of industrial life that stretched around the town like fortifications around some European city but fortifications holding the city safe, not from a foreign invader but from an economic invader. Factory fortresses preserving the prosperity of the town. He continued to eye the crowd and his eyes became less deep and dark. He raised his head without knowing that he raised it. A feeling of pride was upon him. Here's the thing, the real thing, he said within himself. This is the machine, the stroke is there and the bore is there if they can be made to see and to understand. Potter stepped into his car and drove out Woodward Avenue and thence down a side street to that mammoth, unbelievable mass of buildings which all the world, through advertisements, would recognize as the plant of the Waite Motor Car Company. 
Since the day the first brick was laid, a dozen years before, building had never ceased. The plant had never caught up with itself, had never been able to produce the number of automobiles required of it by the public. As far as the eye reached were clean, splendid structures, the ragged outline at the end, dimly seen, was caused by steel not yet covered by brick, by brick walls rising to wall in new space in which to manufacture yet more thousands of the weight motor car. To all this, to this concrete, visible, tangible fortune, Potterweight was sole heir. It was not like wealth in stocks, bonds, securities. It was not in promises to pay, in paper standing for something more substantial. It was there. It could be beheld in the mass. Perhaps a hundred millions of dollars actually reared themselves in brick and steel, in splendid, efficient machinery. Potter had grown up with it, was accustomed to it. Unlike the casual passerby, he was not awed by it. He leaped from his car and ran up the broad flight of stairs leading to the offices on the second floor. Dadden, he flung at the man who sat behind the information desk. Yes, but he's occupied, Mr. Waite. I shouldn't go in. Potter strode past. The man rose as though to call him back and then sat down with a shrug. Potter flung open the door of his father's office, flung himself through it. Dad, have you heard? He said abruptly. Fabius Waite looked up, frowned. I'm busy. Weren't you told? He said. Potter glanced at the other occupants of the room, recognized Senator Marvel, did not recognize the other. He nodded to the Senator. The Germans have torpedoed the Lusitania, he said. It was without warning. More than a hundred Americans drowned women and children like rats, he finished. The Senator was on his feet. The news had been a sudden, bewildering blow to him. What's that? Are you sure? Where did you get it? Potter threw a paper on the desk over which the senator and the stranger crouched with manifest excitement. Not so Fabius Waite. He did not glance at the paper, nor did he seem moved. His broad, clean-shaven, patrician face showed no emotion except, perhaps, a shade of irritation at the other's reception of the tidings. Potter said to himself that his father would sit outwardly unmoved, unruffled, not in the least disarranged mentally, if word were brought him that the dissolution of the universe had commenced. It was true. Fabius Waite would study the information and determine his course of action before he gave a sign that the most sharp-eyed might read. My God, exclaimed the man whom Potter did not know. What will it mean? What will it mean? The senator asked in an odd, frightened voice. What can it mean but war? Potter said. His father merely glanced at him, not contemptuously, not rebukingly, in fact, not as if Potter were a human being at all, but as if he were some piece of the room's furniture to which attention had been called. When you men are through scrambling over that paper, he said, quietly, I'll look at it myself. He did not stretch out his hand for the paper, did not seem to suggest that it be given to him but simply stated a fact. Potter came near to smiling at the alacrity with which senator and businessman abandoned the news sheet and pressed it upon his father. The senator was a big man in Washington and in Michigan, Potter knew. The stranger looked like a man of importance, 
yet Fabius Waite dominated them, made their personalities colorless by the simple fact of his presence. He merely sat there and they were dwarfs beside him. The people, said the senator, there will be no holding them back. They'll sweep us into war as they did with Spain. I heard there were munitions chipped on the Lusitania, said the stranger. Fabius Waite paid not the minutest attention to them, but read calmly, appraisingly, from beginning to end what the paper told of the sinking of the Lusitania. When he was done, he folded the paper neatly and laid it on his desk. There were munitions, said the senator, and people were warned by advertisements in the paper to keep off that boat. What's the difference? Potter demanded. Are we going to let them murder our citizens like this and put up such an excuse as that? Citizens had no business on the boat, said the stranger. They brought it on themselves. There's got to be war, said Potter, his eyes traveling uncertainly from senator to businessman to his father where they remained. There's no other way. What else can be done about such a thing? For one thing, said Fabius Waite, coolly, we can stop jabbering and think about it. You especially, Potter. If you must wag your tongue, go back to the poncher train bar and wag it for the benefit of the gang of loafers you train with. Senator, what suggests itself to you? I must get to Washington. The Senate doesn't want more, I can vouch for that. But the people, perhaps the president can hold them. I gather from your words that he'll be willing to try. He's the last man in the country to want more. There'll be no war. Those German dunderheads. Do they want to pull the whole world down about their ears? They're fools, said the stranger. We won't argue about their wisdom. Whether they were wise or foolish, they seem to have sunk the Lusitania. Fabius Waite paused. And when all said and done, it won't be the Senate, nor the President, nor business, which determines what we will do about it. It's the people who will make up their minds. Don't lose sight of that. Public opinion can be molded. For a while and to an extent. I believe this thing can be handled so that nothing will come of it. It will take careful handling. You agree with me, do you not, Senator? that neither the people nor the business of the Middle West want war? Certainly I do. I have no doubt you will intimate to the President that you have grave doubts if the Middle West will follow him into war will back him up in any belligerent attitude he may have in mind to assume. Fabius Waite's eyes were on the Senator's face and none could tell what thoughts stirred behind them. He did not order, did not direct, did not suggest, but he was imposing his will on this imposing member of an august body as surely and as relentlessly as if he held a revolver at the senator's head. I feel it my duty to intimate as much to him, said the senator. There must, of course, be a protest, said Fabius White. News that the president is preparing a note to the German government will hold the people in check. I incline to believe they will wait for it to see what the president thinks. If it should take time to prepare, so much the better. It would give the country time to cool off. The people have seen what war means, said the senator. They've seen Belgium and France. They've no stomach for a dose like that. Handle this thing right, let them get over the first shock of it and the excitement will die down. The people are sheep. Yes, 
You're perfectly right about delay. Potter had hurried to his father, his soul a flame of emotion. The flame was being quenched. The boy stood silent, looking from one to the other of these men, hurt, amazed. Just why he had come or what he had expected his father to do he did not know. Impulse had brought him. The word patriotism was not in his vocabulary as it was not in the vocabularies of millions of Americans on that seventh day of May. But some spring had been touched, something had been set in motion by the news of that atrocity which would be heralded from one end to the other of the Germanic Empire as a splendid feat of arms. The thing was wrong, the evil of it had seared through to the uneasy soul of the boy and had set afoot within him something which he did not understand as yet. He was not able now to say, Civis Americanism. It was not reason that had brought him. It was no conscious surge of loyalty to his country. It was something something he felt to be right. Perhaps there was a tinge of adventure in it. Perhaps his youth heard the rolling of martial drums and saw the unfurling of flags of war. But he was right and these men were wrong. That he knew. He wondered at the men. There had been no word of sympathy for the dead. There had been no cry of anger wrung from them by this affront to the honor of the nation. There had been but one thought dollars. Business came first. The prosperity of dollars and cents filled their minds to the exclusion of all other prosperities. Even the senator, servant and representative of the people was not serving and representing the people. He, too, saw only the effect of this thing on business. Does everybody think like this? Potter wondered. It might be so. His friends at the table in the Ponchu train bar had been surprised at the news, but he considered their actions those of men who had not been shocked or those of men enraged. Perhaps they, too, were of one mind with his father. Perhaps all the people were of that mind. Perhaps that was the sort of people the American nation had grown to be. Dad, he said, if mother had been on board, dash. She wasn't, said Fabius Waite. Senator, this is mighty ticklish, and it will grow more ticklish. This one act can be smoothed over, but many recurrences of it cannot be smoothed over. Isn't there some machinery to set a foot forbidding American citizens to cross the ocean? That would do it. I wouldn't care to introduce such a resolution, said the senator, but probably somebody can be got to do it. We've a right to travel, Potter said, hotly. Didn't we fight a war about that once? You don't mean to say, Dad, that you actually would have this country admit that it was afraid to claim its rights. The world would laugh at us. Let it said his father. Another year or two of this war and this nation will top them all. We'll be the financial rulers of the world. We're getting there now and nothing must happen to set us back. And the world will despise us, Potter said bitterly. He was beginning to see more clearly now. He paused. This attitude of mind he was witnessing could not be common to all the people. He would not believe it. Dad, think bigger. You men are wrong. You can't head this off. It means war. It's got to mean war. And war means armies and cannon and shell and airplanes. We've got to have them all. Think, Dad, and you'll realize it. Take a telegraph blank, Dad, 
and write the president. You can help with this plant, every other plant like it can help. Why are the president that this plant is at the disposal of the country for any use the country can put it to? Tell him you're with him. Tell him you can make guns or shrapnel cases or motors for him as well as for England or France or Russia as you are making them. And airplanes. We'll need thousands of them. Give that job to me, Dad. I know airplanes, Dash. You know mixed drinks and chorus girls and traffic cops, his father snorted. You won't do it? Don't be a fool. Potter turned and walked out of the room. He stopped at the information desk. Here sat a man who worked for wages, a common citizen. Here sat the sort of man who made up the bulk of that crowd he had watched on Woodward Avenue. Dixon, he said, the Germans have sunk the Lusitania and killed a hundred Americans. Awful, wasn't it? I just heard. What are we going to do about it? Why we'll make him pay for it, that's what. We'll collect damages, millions of dollars. Money, said Potter. You bet, Mr. Waite. Money. Is that all? Will that satisfy you? Isn't that enough? Asked Dixon in real surprise. What more can anybody ask? You don't want to fight? You don't think it means war? Great heavens, no. War. We don't want any of that in ours. I guess this country won't mix in any wars. We've been seeing what war means. Anyhow, what should we fight for? England and the Allies are going to lick Germany, aren't they? Well, let them. Potter turned on his heel. He had his answer. Once more he got into his car and whirled downtown. Once more he stopped before the poncher train and entered the bar. His friends were not there, but he sat down at a table and ordered a drink. He ordered another drink and another. His eyes were dark and brooding. The restless urge to recklessness was upon him that smoldering fire which had made him a young man to be looked upon askance by the respectable. His face was set and he drank. Fred Longmuth came through the revolving door, saw Potter, studied his face and his attitude for a moment and then quietly withdrew. He knew the signs and had no desire to be in Potter's company from that hour on. He sat alone at his table, brooding, drinking from time to time. He felt no hunger, did not arise to eat. The lights came on and still he sat. The room was thronged with the early evening crowd and Potter glowered at the men ordered other drinks. Presently he stirred uneasily, the spirit of unrest, of recklessness was working within him, urged on by liquor. He pushed himself to his feet and stood, not too steadily, and his eyes seemed to flame as he glared over the crowd. His face seemed to flame, to be kindling from some fire that surged up from depths inside him. His yellow hair, brushed back from his brow, added to the flame-like semblance of him. He struck the table with his fist and a glass danced over the edge to smash on the floor. It's a hell of a country, he said, loudly, and you're a hell of a lot of men. The room fell silent and every face was turned toward him. He glared into the upturned eyes. You're a lot of crawling, sneaking, penny-chasing rabbits, he said, distinctly. Brag and blow, that's you. 
And then somebody kills your wives and babies and you haven't the guts to kill back again. You're afraid, the lot of you. You won't fight. If anybody says war, you crawl under the table. Americans, I'd rather be an Eskimo. If anybody slapped your faces, you wouldn't fight. I'll show you. I'll show you what kind of cattle you are. Now, if there's a fight in you, come and fight. He lunged forward and struck a man, upsetting him against a table. The place was in an uproar. It's young wait look out. He's a bad actor. Call the cops. Potter swayed forward into the throng at the bar, striking, striking. In a moment he was the center of a maelstrom of shouting, scuffling men and his laugh rang above their shouts. They struck at him, clutched at him, waiters and bartenders tried to force their way to him. He was pushed back and back, still keeping his feet, still lashing out with his fists, his eyes blazing, his yellow hair rumpled and waving, his reckless laugh dominating the turmoil. His back was against the wall. Before him now was a clear semicircle which none ventured to cross, and he laughed in their faces. Fifty to one, he jeered, and you're afraid. A couple of policemen shouldered their way through, recognized Potter, and stalked. Cut it out now, wait, said one of them. Cut it out and come on. Potter's answer was to step forward and strike the officer with all his strength. The other officer did not parley. His night stick was out. He raised it, brought it down on Potter's yellow hair, and the whole room heard the thud of it. Potter stood erect the fraction of a second, then the stiffness went out of his body and he sank to the floor a shapeless heap. The morning papers printed Potter's picture and news stories of this his most reckless escapade. They also printed moral editorials which, with singular unanimity, pointed out facts concerning young men with too much money, no regard for their citizenship, and mentioned disgracing an honorable name.